everyone. My name is Teresa Welsh, and I am a senior reporter with DevEx. Thank you so much for joining us today for our event. Uh, we're so happy to have you from wherever it is that you are joining us in the world. Um, we are really excited for our conversation here today, uh, coming at an extremely timely moment. Uh, we here at DevEx have been putting a particular focus on uh, food systems, and we're really excited today to have this conversation joined by several distinguished guests. And, um, you know, this is such a timely conversation um, at this particular moment coming out of the pandemic. Uh, even before that, each year malnutrition was killing more children than AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis combined. And malnutrition is a leading risk factor for death in children globally, accounting for 45% of deaths. Yet all, nearly all of these losses are almost entirely preventable. Even before COVID, the situation was dire. Nearly one in three people around the world had at least one form of malnutrition. And based on current trends, this number is set to rise to one in every two by 2025. And we've already seen some really troubling signs of backsliding on nutrition gains. We saw just last week in the annual global report on food crises that an estimated 20 million more people were food insecure in 2020 than in 2019. And in order to tackle malnutrition, an overhaul of the world's food and health systems is needed. The solutions to malnutrition are multi-sectoral and require close collaboration between both food and health systems. DevEx is so pleased to be hosting this event today in collaboration with A Thousand Days alongside our special series, The Future of Food Systems. We're putting a special focus on this content this year in the lead up to the UN Food Systems Summit with events in July and September, as well as the Nutrition for Growth Summit uh, that will be held in December. I encourage, I encourage our audience to visit our website to learn more about this series, check out all of the great content that our team has been producing. Um, and we also welcome you to join our conversation here today during our event. Please put any questions for our speakers in the chat box. We'll get to as many of those as we can. Um, and I'm really looking forward uh, and so delighted to be joined by so many distinguished experts today in a, to advance our conversation around food and health systems reform. I'm joined now by Roger Matheson, who's the Regional Director of Southeast Asia for Alive and Thrive. Roger, thank you for joining us. Welcome. Yeah, thank you. To start out, I want to hear a little bit about the view from where you are. Tell us about what the impact of the pandemic has been like in Hanoi and around Southeast Asia on the food system. Yeah, thank you. So the pandemic uh, are stressing already vulnerable systems um, and further eroding uh, the poor quality of diets here in Southeast Asia. But maybe first, let me just say a bit about the COVID situation, because I don't think everyone knows uh, about that particular for Southeast Asia. So um, the worst hit countries by COVID-19 are Malaysia, Singapore, Philippines, and Indonesia. And we're also very worried about Myanmar at the moment because they also have uh, you know, a military coup. So they have also like other risks um, that affect the, the situation. And we don't have data, uh, reliable data on the COVID situation. Um, the countries that are less affected, the one that has lower numbers, uh, include Thailand, Cambodia, Brunei, um, Laos, and then we have Vietnam, where I'm based, uh, where we have very few cases. Uh, it's a 100 million almost population here and around 3,000 cases. Um, so if you just compare it to the global average, uh, all the countries in this region they have done quite well and they have less uh, cases than uh, per million population than the average um, global average, yeah. Um, but maybe just to say a bit more about that because it's not only the pandemic that are risk here, uh, this uh, region are on the ring of fire. So we have a lot of other kind of risk as well and climate and, and weather related um, hazards. So for instance, here in Vietnam where I'm based, um, Every year we have 11 storms coming and they make landfall as uh, typhoons or storms or depressions with a lot of you know, uh, rainfall. So, um, so that can lead to flooding, landslides and other things. Um, 
and in the region, volcanoes, you have earthquakes, uh, tsunamis. So it's multiple risks, not only the pandemic, um, but to say a bit more about the food uh, security and the food system situation, uh, we have some recent data from, from the Philippines. Uh, it was a recent uh, rapid assessment uh, of the impact of COVID-19 on the, uh, the food supply chain by the UN. Um, and it gives some specific answers. Um, and as with other countries, um, food production and food markets were classified as essential services uh, and exempted from the, the strictest uh, restrictions. Um, however, families and fisher folks, um, they reported difficult in securing inputs um, and, and also most of the shops, the, the financial services were closed. Um, and also across the supply chain, workers had difficulties in reporting to the place of work um, due to quarantines uh, and suspension of public transport, basically. Um, and also the employers, it was hard for them to employ like a full workforce uh, because of the quarantine and also the support services that they had to provide. Um, and also that report mentioned that most farmers, uh, assemblers and retailers in the wet markets and service establishments, they reported dramatically um, reduced sales. Uh, interesting though, in, uh, and in contrast, the quarantines had a differential effects in the modern retail segments, favoring the, the bigger and top supermarkets and also online um, distributors. So, so, so that's a bit of a snapshot, but maybe more importantly, how is it affecting the people? And, we have some recent data from Indonesia, uh, from um, an urban poor study. Um, and this is an important study because more and more people, they live now in cities. Um, and that study found that children under five are eating less uh, nutrient rich, uh, less vitamin A rich fruits and vegetables, meat, poultry, uh, seafood, beans, and lentils. Um, and children are also consuming a high levels of unhealthy foods. Uh, and sugar and sugar sweetened beverages. So the reducing purchasing power and actually an existing preference uh, for commercially packaged foods, uh, probably due to marketing, uh, was a leading contributing factor to the poor diets. Um, one thing that I, I burn for is, is to, to, to put breastfeeding on the agenda. And food systems have really been ignoring, uh, recognizing, and, and not really valuing breastfeeding mothers um, you know women are recommended to breastfeed for six months and continue breastfeeding for two years and beyond that's a, a massive food supply um, and if you look at most of the countries in the world they have not included breast milk in the food balance sheets so they are not really valuing breast milk they're not really valuing uh, that effort by women um, the last thing i would like to mention uh, we conducted a recent study and we see a lot of code violations related to the international code of marketing of breast milk substitutes. So, so families here are being bombarded with uh, inappropriate marketing, undermining breastfeeding. And that comes from the food system. And that's not really providing um, you know, a, a health impact. That was a great overview, Roger. Thank you for that. I feel like that gave us a good sense of what's happening in your region of the world. Um, you know, from Vietnam, where actually you've been pretty successful at battling the pandemic to other countries that maybe have been um, less so. So what does all of this show us about the interconnection between the food system and the health system? Yeah, so tackling mal malnutrition and improving the quality of diet, uh, it depends on working together across systems. So food system, social protection system, I would say also wash system, like hygiene during a pandemic is so important, um, and health systems. Um, um, but I would like to bring us back to Hanoi again to answer that question, because I think Vietnam was a perfect example of working together across systems to make that possible. Um, we have actually just documented that in uh, exemplars in, in Global Health with Gates Ventures, World Bank uh, and others. Um, and also more specifically, the kind of multi-sectoral response to nutrition ha has also been documented uh, together with the scaling up nutrition movement. Um, but just to summarize that, so Vietnam has experience with pandemics. Uh, it had SARS in 2003 uh, and because of that, you had laws in place, you had mechanisms in place uh, for a coordinated response. And it's actually the deputy prime minister 
uh, Vu Duk Dam, who is the government focal point for the emergency response. Uh, and he's also the focal point for the scaling up nutrition movement here. So he's responsible also for the all of government response to nutrition and nutrition security. So I think that's also a, an advantage. Um, so in terms of the multisectoral response, I think very early, already in February, most of the countries hadn't really thought much about COVID back then. Uh, the government collaborated with, uh, with celebrities here and had some, some really catchy songs and dance that I think was all over the, the world news, uh, but it was emphasizing uh, hand washing and how that could protect you from the pandemic. Um, and Kong Dang is a famous dancer here and, and he uh, made the dance moves and he, he made that go viral on TikTok and other social media channels. So a lot of prevention at the beginning. Um, the government also, um, they collaborated with uh, local tech companies, developed in just a few days, a lot of apps. So we were able to uh, get information, communication was going on uh, to declare our health, uh, to assess our risk. Uh, they also boosted us with, uh, with uh, SMS messages about being united, that we really need to, to work on this together. Uh, and I think that's an important message uh, for a pandemic response. Um, more specifically to nutrition, uh, the government also back then in, in February, March, they issued guidelines on, uh, on nutrition for people in quarantines because they saw nutrition as part of the, the defense. Um, and in April, uh, the National Institute of Nutrition, they issued guidelines here um, uh, for vulnerable groups, so elderly, pregnant, uh, lactating women, and, uh, and children, uh, specifically related to uh, the pandemic. Uh, at the same time, the Ministry of Trade and Industry, they closely monitored the, the food supply situation uh, and, and intervened. So we had very, very few just local incidences of vol volatile food prices. Um, and some really cool innovations as well. Uh, companies together with civil society developed, for instance, RISE ATMs uh, to support vulnerable households. Um, oh, cool. So <laughs> I think that's kind of cool. And uh, again, that was also uh, highlighted in the media. So if you're interested in knowing more, you can read more about it there. Um, but one thing I would like to mention was back in February was a girl she was only three months old and she got COVID from her mom uh, her grandmother um, and the response was that she was kept together with her mother uh, the only intervention she received was continued breastfeeding and uh, antibiotics uh, and you know within eight days she recovered she was uh, discharged and that really emphasized the importance of breastfeeding uh, and that was uh, the message also coming out from the media. It was leaflets. It was uh, in radio programs. Uh, so, so it was a lot of focus on breastfeeding as kind of uh, prevention, uh, uh, protecting you from the pandemic, which in many other countries of the world, uh, mothers and newborns were separated because of the fear of COVID instead of the evidence-based intervention uh, breastfeeding has. So, you know, on, on child survival. Yeah, in the um, beginning, it wasn't clear things. what the, um, you know, what the best practices were going to be. And, you know, hospitals weren't necessarily doing, um, you know, the things that we have known to be um, best practices for that. Um, unfortunately, Roger, we are out of time. Um, I feel like we could have chatted for quite a long time, but I really appreciate you giving us the view from your part of the world. It's really interesting to hear, um, you know, how, how things have gone all over the place. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. Thank you. Now I would like to welcome our distinguished panel um, to follow that discussion and continue it forward. Um, I would like to introduce Ruth Onyongo, who's a nutritionist, Kenyan professor and former member of parliament. 
Heather Danton, the project director for the USAID Advancing Nutrition Program, uh, Advancing Nutrition Program with JSI, and Mira Schechter, who is the Global Lead Health Nutrition and Population at the World Bank. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, I am really excited to have this conversation, particularly with such a panel of powerhouse women. So um, thanks for being here, really appreciate it. Um, Ruth, I wanna go to you first and have you um, help us set the scene a little bit as well. And tell us a little bit about, um, you know, what the impact of the pandemic has been on the food system where you live. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Teresa, for inviting me. Uh, I, I love these uh, DevEx uh, forums. Uh, uh, you know, the pandemic has affected everyone. And uh, like you said, uh, we have found that whatever gains we may have made much earlier, you know, trying to reduce stunting, and Kenya was doing very well, uh, trying to deal with issues of, uh, uh, you know, uh, severe malnutrition. Uh, all that has just gone uh, uh, down because uh, people have been uh, short of food and it hit at a time when planting was supposed to be going on. Um, many Kenyans, you know, over 50% live on uh, daily wages, you know, they go out to work to bring home food, you know, and some of them support their rural families as well. And that, at, at the end of the day, you know, they just didn't have any income at all. So this has been very, very hard on the society and uh, uh, the government tried to do what they could, but also as Kenyans, we really rally together, mobilize just to make sure no one's starved and corporates and, you know, just fundraising to make sure we, we have survived up to this point. Not easy at all, but, you know, at the end of the day, we had to really help each other out. It's been hard, very hard. Thanks, Ruth, for that. Um, Mira and Heather, you're both based here in the United States, um, but we, of course, are also not beyond feeling the impacts of the pandemic in our food system. I'd love to hear from you both um, just sort of a, a brief experience of what it's been like where, where you live and sort of what perhaps um, the pandemic has taught us here in the U.S. about our food supply and where food comes from and all of the considerations that maybe we weren't thinking about before the pandemic. Mira, if you want to go ahead. Sure. Thank you very much, Teresa. Um, uh, I must say here in the U.S., initially, we did um, see some food uh, spikes in food prices. And uh, but, uh, but at the moment, it seems like things have calmed down with the pandemic, hopefully <laughs> coming under control. Um, but what we've also seen is a massive increase in, and we don't have exact data as yet, but we have seen a massive increase in uh, consumption of packaged foods, convenience foods. And we know that those are all, um, or most of them are ultra processed foods that have a huge impact on human health. They have an impact on future uh, obesity. And we know that the links between obesity and COVID are very, very strong. And um, individuals who are um, obese have up to 48% uh, greater chance of, of dying uh, um, due to COVID, um, uh, more than 113% increase in hospitalization, 74% increase in ICU. Um, this thing. And th these are data um, that, that have been um, documented, but, but I think over the, the next several months, we'll see much more. And, and I'm hoping we can talk about uh, what's happening in the rest of the world as well as we go along. Over. Definitely. I think that's a great point, Mira, is that we tr we still don't have the true scope of the impact of all of this. We do have some data. Um, Roger brought up, you know, several studies that, that they've done and lots of data points. And we are sort of seeing the reports start to trickle out, but we um, really aren't going to have you know, a measure of the true impact of this for quite some time. And I think that is such a key point to remember. Heather, I'd love to hear from you. Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks for inviting me here. This is really a great panel to be on. Um, so here, I live in a small city in New England, um, and here we actually did have such an uh, immediate impact on employment that um, a number of the 
homeless shelters, the food banks, and those uh, kinds of safety nets that are in place here in the United States were overloaded r- right away. Um, so there were uh, mechanisms that were put in place very quickly by a number of the nonprofits, uh, allowing, in fact, I often would notice in the mornings um, lines of cars, because of course you couldn't also come in contact, so lines of cars, people gathering provisions that have been put together by nonprofits that were um, assisting. And those lines were not, you know, short, small. There were a lot of people um, early in the pandemic uh, as people lost their jobs and that continued for quite some time. Um, that has continued, but in a little bit more focused way. Um, so you don't see the long lines anymore through at the, at the various points of contact. But that's been something that I think was shocking for a lot of people here in the United States to have it so overt. Um, I think the other thing that we've noticed here, um, and I, like my small city is um, mostly sort of blue collar um, workers and that sort of thing. So that as they've been able to get back to work, um, the uh, fear of continuing to spread COVID has also decreased um, the decision making around what they're eating, um, as Mira pointed out, but also in their other behaviors. So healthcare seeking was also way down um, here. And uh, I still am talking to people who are saying that they don't want to go to the doctor because they don't want to be exposed, um, even though things have uh, come back quite a lot. The other thing that we've noticed here is inflation. Um, and I think that this is something that, of course, is occurring worldwide. Um, and it's food inflation as well as just sort of overall inflation. So as the cost of things go up because supply chains are cut back, um, uh, it's continuing to have this impact even as people go back to work. Um, so those are just a few of the observations that I've had here. And, and um, Teresa, if I can just add to that, I think one of the other things we've noticed, uh, certainly in the US, but across the world as well, is that it's women who are at the forefront of the crisis. They are the ones who are bearing the burden the most, whether in terms of job losses that Heather referred to, women have lost more jobs, but they're also the health, primarily the healthcare workers. Uh, they're also oftentimes the food producers and the food sellers. And so, and they are the caregivers in the homes as well. So um, any impacts are, are being um, felt much more by women than um, by men. So just wanted to add that. Yeah, and this- Thanks, Mira. I th- oh, sorry, go ahead, Heather. No, USAID did a sort of a community listening event back in August. Um, where I think the recovery has really come along quite a long way since then, I think because of the advent of the vaccines. But at that time in August, hearing from implementing partners around the world, um, there were a number of points similar to what Mira pointed out, for sure that women are the probably most burdened by this as caregivers, but also that they they were uh, emerging opportunities for youth and women because women are the, the ones that are always coming up with the good ideas of like, how do we solve this problem? Um, and I've seen that even here um, in the United States where a lot of the new nonprofits that are coming up and responding to increased hunger and poverty um, is employing women um, to do this as caregivers. And I think that there's, we're seeing similar opportunities with small business startups um, globally. Ruth, is that something you've been noticing as well? Tell us a little bit about the role that women have been playing in the food and health system during the pandemic um, where you are in Kenya. Well, well, uh, where I am in Kenya always has been the women who are out there looking for food and serving food. But to tell you the truth, the way I've seen it, the way I've observed it, even the way I connect with my rural communities, everybody has been out there looking for food. I've seen young men on TV in the urban areas crying out, open up, we have to take something back home. So I think uh, it's just shown me a different kind of gender inclusiveness when addressing this, uh, this, this issue. Because it's mostly the young men who are out there looking for jobs and so on, construction, that industry opened up very quickly. Those who run kiosks, but of course the women too, when the women suffer, the whole family suffers. 
So, you know, uh, we are still doing some studies. Actually, we are just setting up studies to see how the, the pandemic has impacted the, the, co the communities in terms of gender. So that data is still not out. So what I'm, I'm talking about is just in terms of observation, yes. Thank you. Mira, you were mentioning a bit at the beginning about the, the link between uh, malnutrition and obesity. And you and I have chatted quite a bit in the past about the double burden. Um, tell us a little bit more about some of the concerning trends that we've seen um, during the pandemic and how you know this really poses a significant uh, threat to health as well. Great. So um, when we talk about the double burden, we want to talk about both the undernutrition side as well as the overweight obesity side. And on the undernutrition side, we've done some uh, analysis and some predictions of what we anticipate in terms of increasing um, undernutrition. And we anticipate even by 2022, we will have approximately um, 2.6 million additional stunted children in the world. So instead of going the other direction, we're going to be rolling back progress. Similarly, 9.3 million additional wasted children, 168,000 more child deaths. So all, all that is going to really roll back progress. And the cost of this, um, to mitigate this, we'll need an additional $1.2 billion per year. But the cost on the economy is much greater. So we anticipate a, at least a $30 billion loss uh, associated with, with this rollback in, in, on the undernutrition side. And then on the overweight obesity side, we don't have the numbers as yet. Um, and uh, as several people have already said, this is something that will happen in, in the future and we will then need to document it. But the fact that we are seeing increases in consumptions, consumption of unhealthy foods, um, that is a sign that we, will we can anticipate increases in um, obesity rates. The fact that uh, children are not able to go out and play, so physical activity is, is reduced, um, because of lockdowns and, and the like, we can anticipate increases in um, obesity as well. So lots more to, to see in the future, but uh, for the moment, the, the signs are not good at all. Let me stop there. Thanks, Mira. Yeah, I think um, I think it's such a stark example of how interconnected the food and health systems are. I mean, the 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 carry on effects are so drastic and so obvious, uh, unfortunately. Heather, I'd love to hear from you um, a little bit about how you know your work, your project is is thinking now into the. Future and you know we are hopefully coming out of this pandemic. Um, obviously, we've seen that the you know the timeline changes all the time, and depending upon where you are in the world, you know there's just sort of more hope of normal life sometime soon. Um, but in your work, how are you thinking about at this particular moment the way that food and health systems can be reformed to improve these conditions in the future? Oh, that's a great question. That's a big question. Um, and I think that uh, the idea of uh, reforming and transforming the food system uh, together with the continued investments that are being made in health systems around the world, which I think are getting stronger and stronger, but have been highly impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. So there's been a shift away from that focus that, you know, we were very hopeful on the, the investments going towards nutrition um, within health systems. That's actually been rolled back quite a lot. So I think as we come out of the pandemic, um, keeping the focus within the health system to continue to include and uh, integrate nutrition into quality um, and uh, quantity and comprehensiveness of care is really important. My project has been uh, working uh, on a number, developing a number of tools, working closely with governments and USAID missions, of course, um, to uh, identify the most important gaps within health systems 
and at the same time linking with the food system, especially looking uh, at areas around consumer demand, um, which is another thing that, you know, I think I, I, I really want to pull uh, out Mira's point about uh, diets because the access, uh, availability, and affordability of nutritious foods has been highly impacted by this. Um, data coming out of some of Gaines' work has shown um, that investments by small and medium enterprises in the food sector um, have come down, their production has come down, their prices have had to go up, um, and supply chains, because they're, they've been broken, are not exactly working well. So if you kind of bring the food system sector together with the health system, um, we've got two big things that need to be addressed. And finding those point of, points of intersection is something that we are beginning to look at specifically in a few locations. You know, everything is so contextually specific that we have to do this analysis in particular countries and even within parts of those countries. And I'm sure Ruth, you know, can tell us a lot more in Kenya, um, how different uh, the various food and health systems uh, are within just her country. Um, and I'd like, love to hear more about that, but that's some of what we're trying to do is to work with governments to do this analysis, to be able to figure out where the best points of investment coming out of the pandemic are. Um, so just to start, we've got a lot of this stuff going on too. <laughs> Thanks, Heather. Yeah, Ruth, I, we'd love to hear from you on, on that point. Yeah, you know, initially, um, when it was realized that uh, this uh, 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 a condition, a pandemic especially, that attacks the immune system, and we have had HIV and AIDS before, and from there, we knew that uh, even at that time, patients would sell medication to buy food, that without food, for me, as far as I'm concerned, food is a fast medicine, you know, so you take it very seriously, the quality of food, so we get the impression that uh, the governments are now taking nutrition seriously, as whether it's just temporary or long-term, it's a different matter. You know, uh, research needs to also uh, be able to invest in this uh, traditional foods. People are now going more into uh, their traditional foods. Even our urban markets are getting these foods, you know, growing them, but at the same time, getting them from, from the rural areas. And, you know, knowing that they, they, they are certain foods they must keep away from. And uh, uh, we talked about uh, children earlier, by the way, you know, Kenya is just beginning to reopen schools. And one would wonder, how are the children? You know, what is their nutritional status? And I wish I had the, 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 you know, the means to even take their anthropometry. Because just looking at some of the kids I support, I see them going to school, they look so much thinner, you know, especially those in the rural areas. They probably didn't have enough food at home. They stay there for too long. In the, in the urban setting, it's different. Maybe, you know, what Mira uh, talked about, you know, maybe obesity, overweight, and so on. But I, I think we just need to go back as government seriously to invest within, in, in Kenya, in Africa, within our farming communities, and to also select the kinds of foods that the urban centers can consume and just look at quality of food. You know, look, look at the people, quality of food. Let's invest in agriculture. Let's put it up front. Let it generate jobs as well. You know, so I think this is a, a turning point for us and it just can't be things as usual. We have to revise our policies and the issue of breastfeeding came up, you know, the breastfeeding issue, we just talk about it and then we move on. I think we have to be intentional in just making sure that maternal health is taken care of, infant health is taken care of, school feeding is taken care of, and that we reach out to our mothers. You know, the way we do extension in agriculture, I believe we need extension to mothers, you know, just to teach them and to, you know, let them be aware of what they need to do in terms of even hygiene and sanitation and water. I, I just feel that uh, if we leave this to go, it will be a lost opportunity. There's a lot we can do and we have to do things differently. Even going to the summit in September, we have to do things differently. You know, Fraser. Yeah, 
Mira, both uh, Heather and Ruth have mentioned the importance of investments. Um, would love to hear from you from the World Bank perspective of, you know, how you're thinking about, uh, you know, what donors need to be doing as we're coming out of this pandemic with regards to food and health systems, what role do they play in working in concert with governments to ensure that, you know, budgets really are constrained right now. A lot of countries have much reduced fiscal space. How do we ensure that budgets not only are maintained, but increased to deal with, you know, this, this nutritional fallout that we're seeing after the pandemic? A great question, Teresa. But before we get to that, I do want to add something. Uh, we've talked quite a bit about food systems. We haven't said any or much about health systems. And I think if we are trying to improve nutrition, uh, as Roger said in his uh, initial this thing, we need to look at health systems, but also social protection systems as well. So I'll get you to your investment question, but let me make this comment first. Um, uh, on the um, health system side, I don't know how many of us realize that um, while nutrition is included in SDG 2.2, many of the solutions to the nutrition agenda actually are um, uh, encompassed in SDG 3.8, which is UHC, universal health um, coverage. And yet we see that nutrition is not explicitly included in, um, U uh, in UHC, um, either country. And so it, it sort of remains vulnerable to be excluded in the UHC package either because, and there are usually three reasons why that happens. Um, firstly, because countries have this vague commitment to nutrition, uh, but the nutrition is not explicitly included in the USC benefits package. Um, secondly, because countries often have an unclear understanding of what the financing needs are for that package. Um, and, and as well as uh, prioritization tools, cost effectiveness tools, what are those and how can we, um, how can we um, include nutrition into that? Um, we've done some work on, on optimal nutrition that helps to prioritize uh, investments. Um, and, and then thirdly, which is really an important part of UHC as well, is what are the opportunities to raise revenues for health? And again, we have some opportunities in um, things like um, taxation on unhealthy foods, but those are just being discussed at the moment. And again, we haven't had that conversation under the UHC umbrella as yet. And I think um, we really need to think about that. So I don't want to leave you with a problem on that side. I do want to mention there are solutions to that. Um, and the obvious solution being that we, every country, we need to help each country develop an explicit, costed, prioritized nutrition package that can be included under UHC and um, also strengthen the um, revenue uh, streams, nutrition related revenue streams so that we can add to the fiscal space um, there as well. Um, now, on your um, question on um, how is this agenda going to be financed, um, it's, it's very clear from everything we've heard from um, donors, um, particularly bilateral donors, that overseas development aid is going to be constrained um, because their economies are suffering and or for many reasons linked to that, ODA is going to be constrained. That being the case, um, domestic financing is also being constrained for similar reasons. Um, plus the fact that wherever domestic financing is available, countries have to, as Ruth was saying, uh, prioritize those resources for fighting the COVID virus, uh, rather than putting into what people think as may not be necessary at the moment, which is the nutrition agenda. So what, what is the alternative? The alternative really is to start looking much more closely at innovative financing um, that may be available. And we did a blog on that recently um, that you might want to look at. Um, 
And um, on the innovative financing side, there are partners like the Power of Nutrition that's trying to bring in private sector financing. Um, there is the Global Financing Facility that's trying to do something similar as well. But really, we need to push that agenda much further and we need to get the private sector to contribute uh, resources, not just talk in, in that space. So let me stop there, I can go on forever on that. Thanks, Mira. So many great points there, I think, and, um, you know, definitely outlining some of the challenges that we face, but also appreciate your providing solutions as well. Um, Heather, I would love to hear from you um, a little bit about that private sector side and sort of how, you know, when you are thinking about partnerships in countries, um, you know, working with a government, but also bringing private sector in, you know, how can those actors be working in collaboration really to spur on this? reform when, as Mira just outlined, there really are a lot of challenges. Yeah, thanks. Um, I mean, clearly private sector has to be a part of this solution. Um, I think we also have to acknowledge the challenge involved in targeting uh, our collaboration with them. Um, private sector, by definition, is uh, something that needs to be sustained through profits. Um, so, uh, you know, targeting our, our collaboration with them needs to include opportunities that strengthen small and medium enterprise, but also micro enterprise. Every small farmer is a business. Um, and if we really look at what's happening with production, you know, sort of that, that first part of the food system, looking at production and the supply chains to a small farmer, um, that is something that still to, I mean, after all of these years of investment, we tend to go up and down. And at the end, the small farmer always loses, not recognizing also that the small farmers increasingly are women um, and we want to engage them more and give them the same sort of like equitable access to financing and opportunity and resources. If we're going to do uh, work that is sustainable for improving food systems for nutrition, we're gonna have to somehow uh, identify best practices for this challenge between profit and uh, environmental sustainability. Um, and that's a tough thing. I mean, I, I think that more economic analysis coming out of these large investments, um, I mean, I, I know that we're gonna be talking a little bit more about the um, Nutrition for Growth and uh, Food Systems Summit work later, but I, I think it's gonna, those two efforts are going to result in a number of really great opportunities and ideas and suggestions and everything, but I think it's going to be a little bit dizzying and we're going to have to come back to the basics. How do we make farming something that is viable? Because if we don't have viability in our farm systems, um, youth will not stay in the sector um, and uh, we won't have the levels of production of these nutritious foods, which we already know costs a little bit more across the food system. Um, we've got to you know, keep a focus there as well as um, making sure that other small and medium enterprises within the food system are supported to be able to play the role that in the end reaches the consumer. And at the same time that the consumer is demanding the foods that we are hoping um, they're going to be eating more of. So it's uh, complex, but um, I think we can do it. I really um, want to sort of congratulate Ruth on pointing out that there are a lot of things that we can do and that this pandemic has actually given us an opportunity to look at things in a different way. Um, so I'll stop there because I don't know if that was a long time. <laughs> can I just add on to what Heather has just said, uh, that the private sector. You know, private sector has to be on the table. They are the same in private industry producing foods which are unhealthy, snacks which are not good for children, you know, which people just pick up, you know, they call it food. It's not food. For us to really get this to change, we have to have food producers, the private sector in the industry to be at the table. They can still do what they do, but produce healthy foods. At the same time, I feel like we talk about how to bring about change, how to decrease the level of malnutrition and stunting is decade after decade. Resources do not reach where they should. 
Like Africa has a lot of, a lot of community-based organizations. I'm telling you, they don't get even breadcrumbs, you know? And there's a lot one can do to influence using very little. It's not, it doesn't even cost a whole lot of money that we hear about that comes to countries. And some of it goes back unused and some of it is misused. We have to really change the way we channel funds to the community level so it can have impact at the family level. I hope that can actually be discussed even going forward. Yeah. Thank you. Definitely. Thanks so much, Ruth. And um, Heather, thanks so much for bringing us to sort of this moment that we find ourselves in ahead of the Food Systems Summit and Nutrition for Growth in December, because I do think that's a really important framing. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about the pandemic. Obviously, we can't forget that, but an important framing for this conversation and thinking about sort of these events that had been scheduled and were set to take place even before the pandemic. Nutrition for Growth obviously was supposed to be last year. It got postponed to this year, and the Food Systems Summit had already been on the calendar for this year. And we we now have another whole host of challenges uh, that we weren't even anticipating when those two events were first conceived and planned. And so um, even more timely than ever, of course. Uh, so Mira, I would love to hear from you about how you are thinking about this particular moment. You know, we talked a little bit about all of the, the dialogue that has been happening around these. How can we really ensure that this is a um, moment of change when um, we have so many challenges and so many things that need to be fixed all at one time. Right. Question, Teresa. <laughs> Thank you. Um, first, first and foremost, as we move towards uh, these uh, really important moments in time, I think we need to think about what are the opportunities that we are missing in scaling up the nutrition agenda. And we, we, I, Rebecca had a big camp and she wrote the Lancet uh, series paper spoke about the opportunity gap. I think we are missing the opportunity, for example, to scale up nutrition interventions to the health system. Um, some things like iron folic acid um, supplementation, we know how to do it. And yet, uh, for only 30 to 36 percent of countries in uh, low middle income countries are, are actually scaling up my mind. Even in upper middle income countries, it's only about 41%. So we're, we need to make sure that we use the delivery systems in the health system to, to, to deliver. Similarly, and Roger Mishima referred to the safety net systems too. Currently, lots of safety net programs being scaled up, but we are not necessarily, we are starting to, but we are not necessarily maximizing the delivery of nutrition services linked to those platforms as well. Coming to, to the actual moments in time, uh, the Food Systems Summit has, has a triple uh, challenge. Uh, one, of course, food and nutrition security. That is critical. Mira, forgive me. I'm going to interrupt you just for a moment. We seem to be having some microphone feedback um, on a couple of our mics. So our, um, our production team is going to address that. So just hold on one moment because I want to make sure our audience um, can hear what you're saying and okay. the important points that you're making. Um, Heather, let's see how your mic is doing, if we can get a clear line from you. Um, but would love to hear your perspective on um, this moment that we're in as well. Yeah, let me know if my sound is OK. You sound great. Great, great. Um, I think Mira's, I'm, I'm anxious to have her repeat some of what she had started to say, because she was really laying out um, a, a nice view of where this these two efforts coming together so much on, on the heels of each other. I mean, having Nutrition for Growth coming right after the Food Systems Summit is a great opportunity for all of us, but it is going to be uh, complex. Uh, and I think that the, the challenge will be to maintain the kinds of coalitions and coordination that's needed for um, countries to take ownership of the range of opportunities and ideas and uh, gaps that might be identified and solutions to those gaps that come out of uh, these, the, both of these efforts or both of these events. Um, that in-country work then, it needs to then keep people at the table who have also fed into the planning of this including private sector and research and implementers and 
I mean, I completely agree with Ruth in terms of um, sort of like community-based organizations. We have a lot of wonderful work being done on a shoestring. How do we maximize the output um, and outcomes from the work that these uh, really committed people are doing already on the ground? And we've seen through, because of the pandemic, um, you know, the international presence in a lot of small communities, you know, most vulnerable locations is not there. But, you know, we are seeing just through my project, we're seeing um, and being able to support the work of uh, community-based organizations stepping right in um, with us really more providing uh, better um, support from underneath with some tools some better practice networks to share those better practices within that, that um, sort of the local, at the local level. So that needs to be kept in mind as well as these large, you know, high level, it all needs to come together. So that coordination at, at national level, I think the follow on from both of these is going to be that, you know, investment to maintain that, that coordination and collaboration. But I'm going to hand it back to Amira because she was saying some great stuff. <laughs> Yeah, Mira, let's try to go back to you and see if we've got a, a clearer line for you now. Okay, is this better? Yes, perfect. Okay, okay, great. Well, thank you. I, I'll pick up from where I had a uh, stop. Um, uh, essentially, the two summits, uh, the Food System Summit has, has it, they're slightly different, but uh, uh, interlinked agendas. So the Food System Summit is going to focus on we believe three challenges that they are going to have to address. First is, of course, food and nutrition security. Secondly, making sure that, they, uh, that we help to protect livelihoods that we've talked about through this session, but also how can we use natural resources sustainably so that we reduce greenhouse gases. And I think that that is a big enough agenda for the Food Systems Summit. Uh, what I'm not clear about of that summit, and maybe just that I don't know enough, um, is that uh, what, what exactly are we aiming for? What, when, how can we decide whether the summit is a success or not? And I'm not quite clear as yet as to what the, the ultimate uh, goal is and who will monitor those outcomes. So that's on the food system summit. On the Nutrition for Growth Summit, I think um, the focus is to build on the Food System Summit, but then to bring, uh, bring in pledges um, from uh, public sector, private sector, uh, NGOs, and all stakeholders, researchers across the board. Um, and there is actually a very clear commitment guide that is available on the N4G website. Um, and, and uh, in the focus on pledges, uh, or, and we've, we've contributed to developing the commitment guides, we've tried to make sure that there are policy pledges as well as financial pledges. And, and the important thing will be to make sure everybody makes meaningful pledges. Uh, because if we want countries to be able to scale up the nutrition agenda, and I'm also the chair of this uh, Scaling Up Nutrition Executive Committee, so I do want to mention that as, as well. If we want them to scale up, we need to provide financing to the countries. We need to provide capacities, but also our support capacity development, but also provide financing. Without that, it becomes a, a lot of talk, but not, not really enabling them to act to, to do that. Um, so uh, the important thing uh, here will be making those pledges and, and having a mechanism to monitor how those pledges are, um, whether we, are, we make our pledges, make good on our pledges or not. And I will um, end with my, my mantra on that, which has always been, we need to make sure we bring in more money for nutrition for sure but we also need to make sure that we, bring, um, that we are able to deliver more nutrition for the money that is being um, uh, allocated. And that is very much part of the um, new strategy for the Sun Movement. It's very much part of the n um, 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 Summit, and it's very much part of what we are doing at the World Bank as well. So let me stop there. Thank you.
Thanks, Mira. Um, I think you made such a key point, right? Accountability. How are we actually going to measure and hold people accountable for commitments that they make both at the Food System Summit and at Nutrition for Growth? How are we really going to decide what success looks like for these events and how are we going to measure the change that we want to see? I think that's such a key point. And as you said, it sort of remains to be answered um, and will be a key portion um, of really the success of these events. We've only got just a few minutes left, but Ruth, we've got one last audience question for you. Um, how can middle and or how can small and medium enterprises be part of the sustainable food solution when um, larger um, multinational food corporations and larger countries who often produce and sell unhealthy foods have so much power? That's tough, but you know, I just wanted to say something about Mira's comment on pledges and accountability. You know, we've been there before. You know, these pledges, we are going to put this money, I go back to the ground, nothing ever reaches there, you know, so I don't know what will make it different, Mira. Uh, but the, the question you are asking, uh, uh, Teresa, is um, I, 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 I think the small and medium enterprises just need to come together as and also form a corporate entity. There are so many, like in Kenya, there are so many. I mean, if you just, yeah, they came together and organized themselves and had a big voice and stamped their authority on the, on the nation and say, we are going to produce good snacks, good food, healthy food. Then they begin to compete with the multinationals, you know, then everybody can now think of how to make sure that the food that goes to the consumer is actually healthy. They should just make that their motto, you know, but as individual entities, they are too small to make an impact. As of now, really, yeah, yeah. That, that's what I would advise, but they have a huge opportunity. But there are many, there are many, many in number and it takes some leadership to just organize themselves. And I know they can do it. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ruth. Um, Heather, I'm gonna go back to you just for one minute. Um, we are coming down to the wire, but wanna hear your thoughts on this accountability piece. What do we need to be doing to sure that all of these pledges um, are carried forward, people actually do what they say they need to do? Yeah. I. Um you know, not to be doubting of all of this. I think it's great that we're all coming together. Um, I know that whenever a lot of people come together, there's a lot of excitement and a lot of uh, motivation and good intent. But I think it is that follow-up piece that's really important, um, along with the recognition that we are talking about a global food system. There's no way to really look at um, the food uh, policy or food system based policy in one country without understanding what's happening in other countries. You know, when, when subsidized the, the price of corn that's been subsidized here in the United States makes it easier or more affordable for farmers or individuals or small business or processors to purchase their corn from the United States when they're based in Honduras or Peru, um, we've got a, you know, we've got a, a, you know, not a problem, but something that would need to be acknowledged um, and thought about with regard to the impact that globalization and a, a commitment to equity that I hope will be coming out of both of these summits may have on some of the um, uh, commitments and investments and long-term conversations um, and collaboration that's gonna be happening globally um, coming out of both of these summits. Thanks so much, Heather. Um, thanks so much to all of you. Um, unfortunately, it's time for us to bring this conversation to a close. I really enjoyed being here with our distinguished panel. Um, I hope that our audience learned something new, took away some inspiration from this conversation. We had a great overview of, um, you know, a lot of the challenges that we really are facing, but some of the solutions as well and things that we all can be doing um, during this, this year where we have such an intense focus on these issues. And I think also 
collective realization post pandemic during the pandemic, unfortunately still not over of why these, why these things need to be fixed, why we need to be reforming the food system and the health system. So thank you all so much for being here with us. Thanks again to thousands and days for hosting this with DevX. And again, I encourage all of you to check out our Future of Food System series. You can find it on our website for lots of great content. Um, we'll be continuing to really focus on this topic throughout the year as we um, approach and have some of these bigger events that we have been talking about. So thank you so much. And we look forward to continuing to have you as a part of our conversation. Great. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye.